for a long time, so one of the feedback that I get a lot on my writing is that it's really uh, rhythmic or it's like musical or, or it flows really well. And I think that's because I read um, I read my blog post out a lot. Um, like for, for this particular post that just went up today, I read this out to myself five times before I posted it. Um, and I think the, the way that it flows is because I read it to myself a lot. And specifically there are sort of rhythms that I go for um, in my writing. Uh, that I think works really well. And so I wanted to just talk about and go through and kind of break down this particular blog post, which is about a thousand words, and break down like all of the pieces that, that go into it and kind of how I assembled all the pieces together. So in case it, it's kind of useful or interesting to you, if you like my style of writing um, and, and how all the pieces fit together. Um, so so yeah, let's see let's see kind of how this goes. And if, if people like it, I might do this with more of my pieces. Um, so this this piece is called the job of a writer, um, and you should you should go read it because I'm not going to go explain what this piece is about in this video. But the main idea is asking a question of if you're a writer, what what is your responsibility? Like what are you actually trying to do? If your if your job is is writing, you know what is the impact? What is the output of your work? What's the the actual sort of end result that you're aiming for as a writer? So um, so that's that's like the gist. I start out with um, kind of a story about this typewriter called Olivetti Letera, um, which is which is this like really gorgeous, well-designed typewriter. And then it there's kind of a pivot point in the middle where I switch from the story um, using a metaphor into the main question of the essay. And in the end, I kind of tie it all back together. Um, but I think we can just sort of start from the top. So, uh, the, so the post is called The Job of a Writer, which is going a phrase that's going to come up uh, multiple times um, in this post. Uh, in the beginning, um, so if you're a mechanic, you might have a favorite tool in your box. If you're a runner, perhaps your favorite running shoes. A violinist may have their favorite bow, and a programmer may have their favorite language. These are tools of aspiration. They help us get our jobs done. So this is a whole thing. So so in the in the first four sentences or four kind of clauses, you have the same thing repeated four times in sort of um, different contexts. And this is something that I like to do. It's just there's there's a constant rhythm. Of in each sentence. So there's one about a mechanic, one about a runner, one about a violinist, and then a language programmer. Um, and it sets the reader into that rhythm. And then in the end, after they're used to that rhythm, uh, these are the tools of aspiration. This is a much shorter sentence. So this is kind of like, okay, this is there's a conclusion. We're gonna change paces now. Um, and this like a bunch of long sentences followed by a really short sentence has the impact of like, okay, saying like, okay, this is this is the end of my, one of my ideas. Uh, and then these are the tools of aspiration. They help us get our jobs done and they have the same number of beats. So we wrap this up once, these are the tools of aspiration and then they help us get our jobs done, wrap it up again. Um, so this has kind of a concluding feeling to it rhythm wise. But beyond that, so then I'm saying, okay, we're almost ended, but but we're continuing on this idea. Beyond that, they can inspire us in our craft and remind us of the joy when we feel when we create, the rush we feel when we get in the zone. So again, I'm repeating here a little bit, where I'm saying, remind us of the joy we feel when we create, the rush we feel when we get in the zone. Uh, so again, you see kind of a parallel structure of we feel something we feel when we do something, something we feel when we do something. Um, so in the from the very beginning, I'm establishing sort of kind of like a, a rhythmic um, flow to it, if you will. And then, so this is this is intro. Um, and then for me, as a writer, that tools of aspiration is the Olivetti de Terra, which is a typewriter. Um, and this is the real, this is the real introduction to the post. This is kind of the intro to the intro. This is the real intro where I'm saying, okay, this is the actual topic that we're going to start talking about and digging into. Uh, so it's this is kind of set off in its own paragraph because I really want people to pay attention to it and saying, okay, flashing lights, this is, this is like the, the main, main intro. Uh, because it's visually set off, that kind of has that effect as well. This paragraph isn't super interesting. It's basically talking about the historical context of the typewriter. I'm not going to go through it and read it all, but um, uh, whenever I bring up like an interesting object, like this typewriter, like a very specific object, I like to give a little bit of a historical background, especially since this is kind of like a, a timeless vintage item. Um, and so much of kind of the tone of this post relies on on the typewriter being this like classic kind of object of design and craft. Um, this history, this little bit of history makes uh, uh, helps establish that tone, uh, but there's not a lot of rhythm to it. It's just a straight kind of explanation. But towards the end, I say, I first encountered the Latera at an industrial design museum in the outskirts of Indianapolis. So then, even without reading the next paragraph, you kind of know, okay, this is probably where I'm going. Like, I'm going to probably talk about the story of how I, how I found about this typewriter. So this is how it flows into the next paragraph. Um, and there's a picture of the typewriter. It's, it's, I think it looks fantastic. Um, and and as as I kind of signaled, 
over there in the previous paragraph, um, here I'm diving into that story. And this is starting to become a little more descriptive, and I, I'm really trying to paint a really rich um, descriptive picture of, of this uh, in the reader's mind, not just so they can picture it and understand how the typewriter works, but to like have them stand with me over this like glass box with a typewriter inside and really feel what I'm feeling. And so here I say, they're underneath a warmly lit glass box set of bright cherry red, all of the Tealotera, a special Valentine's edition that trades for 400, 500 a day in the vision market. Um, here, white capital letters with blocky curves and thin lines decorated the otherwise smooth black keycaps, which extended their mechanical lengths below the decks of the typewriter, converging together precisely at a single point, where a click of a key would result in ink-dipped keycaps stamping out in intentional letter after letter at the hands of a typist. So this is a really long sentence. Um, and it's, it's so long, and I didn't break it up, because I want this to be kind of one long musical phrase that's like so long that it draws attention to it. And I, I, I wanted to draw attention because this is where I like I'm painting that mental picture, right? But in the sentence, there's sort of three mini phrases. So the first one is this, which is describing the keycaps, uh, white capital letters, block curves, blocky curves, thin lines, smooth black keycap. So this is just four nouns with adjectives attached to them. Uh, that's just like what, what the typewriter has. And then there's this next phrase, which is they extend in their mechanical lengths below the deck of the typewriter. Um, so I'm starting with the keys coming, going under the typewriter. Um, so this is kind of the next, next part of the typewriter. And then they converge together at a single point uh, where a click of a key would result in inked keys, blah, 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 at the hands of a typist. Um, so here I'm describing what it is, and then in the in this back section of the paragraph, I'm describing. I'm sort of trying to imagine what this thing looks like in action, uh, and specifically this like idea of converging at a single point. I like because it it creates this image of okay, here's a bunch of different keys and pieces of the typewriter, and they they're like all aiming towards a single um, a single point. Um, and it, it draws this image of everything's coming together for the single goal, which is writing, which is which is a, a metaphor that I refer to later in this post. But it's converging together at a single point where the the head of that that stamp, the typewriter, is going to meet the paper. Um, so this is a, I, I I like the way that um, I, I don't like it that much, but I think it's it's a decently constructed kind of kind of sentence. Um, and then after each mark, the typewriter shifts the paper forward slightly and waits for the next move. So this, the first half of this paragraph describes like what it is, and then the second half sort of focuses on what it looks like, what the typewriter looks like in action. And that's really important because the next paragraph is all about that action. It's all about the ultimate point I'm building to is to, to be able to talk about the action of a typewriter. So this is what it is. Uh, this is what the typewriter looks like when it's actually doing something. So starting here, when you press down on a typewriter's key, a system of levers attached to the key move moves under the casing of the typewriter to result in a particular character landing on paper. This system of levers that stamp out letters and paper is called the action of a typewriter. And the terminology is still with us today. In 2020, we refer to the action of keys on a keyboard rather than the levers of a typewriter. And this paragraph is, is mostly a transition between this one when I'm talking about the, the, the typewriter and trying to draw that image in the user's mind. And this one, which is where I'm gonna try to ask the question of what is in the action of writing. So all of this front half of this post is building towards this kind of wordplay that I'm doing, where I'm referring to the fact that, that in a typewriter, each key has an action, and that action is a mechanical action printing ink on paper. And I'm trying to connect that to this wordplay where I'm talking about, there's also this action of writing, like a writer writes, and that is an act of writing. So you can call that an action of writing. And, and so I'm, I'm trying to draw this kind of mirror image, uh, and this is the pivot point. And I'm trying to get to this pivot point from just the description of the typewriter. And the way I get from this, this like image of a writer, image of a, of a typewriter to this pivot point um, is with this paragraph, which just talks about the action of a typewriter. Um, and so the focus of this thing is just the word action. Um, and that's, that's kind of what the paragraph does. And then we say, um, I always thought the word was an interesting choice, almost a wordplay. What's in the action of typing? What's in the action of writing? And you can almost feel, you can feel the like mirror image being drawn here of like everything before this post is about typewriters. Everything after this, I'm gonna talk about writing. And this is like the, that pivot point, but it's such a smooth transition um, because it's pivoting around this like single word that has this double meaning. So, so now we're in the second half of this blog. Uh, 
um, is what is in the action of writing? And I'm going to elaborate on this question and then try to answer it. So this is where I, this is where I elaborate on this question. But in order in order to elaborate, I I go on a bit of a detour. And the detour is about a novel. So a standard novel contains at least 50,000 words, almost 300,000 letters, 300,000 hits of ink-soaked mechanical arms imprinting little marks on an empty paper, and 300,000 intentional strokes at the hands of a skilled writer. Um, so this is another kind of rhythmic paragraph. Um, I repeat the word 300,000 a lot here. Um, and it's, it's also sort of written out in words, right, instead of being... Arabic numerals on paper because I really want to drive the home drive home the point that like these are a, this is a lot of stuff this is a lot of characters that are all converging towards a single goal um, and so I repeat this word a lot and there's also this sort of vague sense of rhythm um, here where where I say so the first part of the rhythm is it's always like a call and response the first part of the rhythm is three hundred thousand hits of ink soaked mechanical arms imprinting little marks on an empty paper. That's the first part. The second part is in 300,000 intentional strokes at the hands of a skilled writer. So this thing parallels this thing. And if you look carefully, it starts with 300,000, talks about something, and it ends on adjective noun, specifically ends on empty paper and skilled writer, which kind of rhyme, which is actually really nice. And so this is, this is an interesting kind of sentence. And then again, 300,000 little actions, conversion time towards a single larger action, the action of writing. Um, and I, I like this because it calls back to this idea of something converging towards a larger thing. So before, it was in this description of a typewriter and all the keys converging towards a single point where the, the ink meets paper. Now, we're using that same word, that same idea, and saying a bunch of these... So in the typewriter, it was the keys converging in space towards a single point. Uh, in this case, it's a bunch of little letters that are typed. The action of typing, all con the 300,000 little actions of typing converging in time towards this endpoint where your, your like work of writing is done. Um, so it's calling back to the like, idea of converging um, and, and saying we're going to talk about the action of writing. But the action of writing only begins on paper or on screen. If the action of a single typewriter key makes impact when it meets paper, where does the action of a writer end? So... I started this transition here, and here's like this mirror image, and then this is really driving it home. Um, so now we're going to talk about the action of writing and saying uh, the action of writing only begins on paper. So, so I talk about the action of a single typewriter key. You, it starts when you press the key down, and it ends. It it, it makes impact when that thing hits paper. So it, it has a start and an end. So if that action has a start and an end, where does the action of, of a writer, where, where do, it starts on paper, clearly, because uh, you start writing there, but where is the job of a writer done? What is the end of, of the task of writing? Where, it's like, where does that responsibility end? That's the question I'm trying to ask. Um, and I, I sort of hint at it here really lightly, and then I really drive the point home here. So hopefully that, that, um, that uh, parallelism between the typewriter and the, and the writer itself uh, kind of makes sense and comes through. Um, but that's what the paragraph is doing. Um, begins on screen. The the last thing that I wanted to mention on this paragraph uh, is this sentence, because I think it's interesting in its rhythm. So the action of writing only begins on paper or on screen. So uh, if you, so this paragraph is, this thing is parenthesized in at the end of a paragraph or at the end of the sentence for a very specific reason, which is that if you removed this thing, the tenth sentence would sound but the action of writing only begins on paper. And there are five beats in the sentence, but the action of writing only begins on paper. And satisfying sentences tend to have sort of even numbered beats. And so if I if I add or on screen, which is also sort of acknowledging that we're in this digital world now, then the sentence becomes, but the action of writing only begins on paper or on screen. So now there's, there's seven beats. Um, which it just feels more satisfying to me. Um, so it's not quite even, but, but it has seven beats, which, which is, sounds more satisfying to me, um, just rhythmically. Uh, maybe you hear that, maybe you don't. Um, but I think I think adding this extra two beats here with or on screen um, just wraps up the sentence more nicely. Um, so that's a little bit of a detail. And then here again, I have this isolated sentence in its single paragraph visually set off from the other ones, because this is the main, this is really the question I'm trying to ask in the post, is what really is the job of a writer? But if I just ask this, this question um, point blank, you're not going to know what I mean. Like, what is the job of a writer? Is it to like get paid writing a book? Like, what am I talking about? And so, so all of this thing, all of this before, 
in order in, in addition to being a hook to the blog post is trying to underscore what my exact intent is when I ask this question. And what my exact intent is, is to say, what is the end, end point of the act of writing? If the beginning point is when I start typing stuff and putting words on paper, what is the end point? Where does that responsibility of the writer end? So that's what I'm asking. Um, and I, I, I paraphrase my qu initial question here to really underscore that like this question really is this question. It's the same question, but I'm just phrasing it here as, 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 as a question about the job of a writer. Okay. Um, so we're, we're almost through. The last, the last thing is all about this question and trying to answer this question. And so what it really is the job of a writer. And really, if I really wanted to shorten this post, I could just start here uh, because everything before this line is just serving as a funnel to this question. Um, and then so we start with this question and this rest of the thing, rest of the post is kind of a separate, um, separate essay uh, or a separate section from the rest of the beginning. So from here, um, we we're going to talk about we're going to this is kind of a mini introduction and then we have sort of two mini body paragraphs to this or three mini body paragraphs three four mini body paragraphs to this like section and then we have kind of a concluding paragraph so this is the this is kind of a mini intro to this new section trying to answer this question uh, sometimes writing is a weapon mightier than the sword we say but writing can also carry a scent of love or a tinge of hate it moves it persuades it educates it informs sometimes it lies and deceives we know vaguely that writing has power but it can also be a gentle kind of power a wave that rumbles not a thunder that roars it's impossible to say that a writer has a single task in the world or that writing is capable of a single kind of force this is because the action of writing isn't raw power its strength comes from something more fundamental so this really is a mini par a mini kind of introduction because this thing, this is a transition into the main. This is basically the thesis of this mini section is that the, the action of writing isn't just this like weapon like power that a lot of people refer to when they see the pen is mightier than the sword. Um, it's actually something more fundamental. And we're going to talk about what that what the fundamental thing is later. Um, but this part is literally just um, what I like to think of as like putting the reader in the right mental zone. Um, so. So I'm just naming a bunch of examples, right? Naming a bunch of examples and drawing a bunch of dichotomies. Uh, so like a scent of love or a tinge of hate, that's like a nice parallelism. Uh, it moves, it persuades, it educates, it informs. Sometimes it lies and deceives. Uh, so there's, this is a very, there are very clear beats to this, this, this string of words. It moves, it persuades, it educates, it informs. Sometimes it lies and it deceives. So there's seven beats here again. Yeah, it just seems satisfying to me. Um, so sometimes it lines and deceives is the last three beats. So there's seven beats here. It's like a satisfying bunch of words. Uh, it's another kind of phrase. And then, uh, we know vaguely that writing is power, but it can also be a gentle kind of power. Uh, this is another seven beats. We know that we know vaguely that writing has power, but it can also be a gentle kind of power. So that's another seven beats, another phrase, um, a wave that rumbles and a thunder that roars, another dichotomy, another kind of contrast of parallels. Um, so there's a lot going into, in, especially in introductions, I like to really, really stretch out the kind of musicality of phrasing. Uh, so there's a lot of rhythm stuff going into here. Uh, but that's that's the construction of the paragraph. Um, and then this sentence just transition to the thesis, which is, which is the action of writing isn't raw power, its strength comes from something more fundamental. Um, and then this is the money quote of this post. Uh, or one of the two. The job of a writer is to reach out into the world on behalf of the reader, to be their senses and their minds, exploring and interacting with where the reader can't. Good writing is an extension of the reader into corners of the world they haven't experienced, and whatever the writing speaks of, the reader encounters it. The better the writing, the sharper the surrogate senses of the reader, and the more visceral the encounter. So this is really the, when I ask the question of what is the job of the writer, this is really the answer, right? Which is why it's obviously bolded. Um, and most of this paragraph is just kind of normal sentences, except for the end um, where I have this kind of triplet. So, so whatever the writing speaks of or, or, or the reader encounters it, the better the writing, the sharper the surrogate senses of the reader, and the more visceral the encounter. Um, and this is just a rule of three. Like three things sound better than two. And so the better the writing, the sharper the surrogate senses of the reader, and the more visceral the encounter. So it's three things sound nice, I think. Um, so those three things are there. And then this is my point, but then I got to back it up with some um, support or evidence because I'm just I'm just like blatantly stating facts here um, or opinions here. And so this is the evidence to the paragraph, which is this is obviously in the case of stories, novels, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, I'm not going to read this whole paragraph because it's it's mostly kind of um, explanation. Um, but there's some interesting stuff in here. Um, most of this is talking about um, how you know writing. Um, it's easy to think about how in novels and memoirs, uh, you're the writer is literally transporting not literally, but but figuratively, literally transporting the reader into another world and, and having them live another experience. But I'm saying uh, there are experiences to be lived in even writing without a clear story. In texts about science and math, there are perspectives from those researchers. Um, in even in even in rhetoric, uh, even in political rhetoric or persuasive speeches, we feel the writer's own hands pointing and gesturing at parts of the world, saying like, "Look at this thing that that like you haven't noticed before. Here am I to like point this out." Um, so there is. The, there is another kind of rule of three here, which is I start with this like really strong, obvious example of novels and memoirs, and then that's one example. The second example is, is mathematicians and scientists. That's the second example, and the third example is persuasive speeches and political rhetoric. So there's another kind of three from different kinds of text or kind of literature that I'm pulling from that go into this paragraph, and then I tack this on at the end in a revision pass, um, where I'm saying even in this very essay. Here I am assembling little alpha and minor characters in line to show you a way I see the task of writing. Um, so I thought this was just a nice way to wrap up the paragraph because otherwise the transition didn't work super well. Um, but I tacked this on in the revision um, because it, but because the structure of this sentence is so separate, I don't think it disturbs the rule of three. It's like three and then there's this extra thing tacked on at the end of the paragraph. Um, almost to the end. Um, this is my favorite paragraph in the whole blog. Um, so I'm just gonna read it out. No matter the subject, good writing is an extension of the reader's experience into the world. Each word is an arrow that guides the reader through a new story and a new perspective of understanding life. For you, a writer, your job is to explore and discover the world on behalf of the reader, to feel and understand and investigate until your glasses become tinted with color, then to lend those colored glasses to the reader so they may see the world as you do. There's a lot going on in this paragraph. Um, uh, so, so see what's happening and then see if we can like identify a higher kind of pattern. So this is just a transition, kind of a restatement of the argument that I've been making the last few paragraphs. Good writing is an extension of the reader's experience into the world. Um, this is one of the few sentences that I started this draft with and I've just kind of expanded it out. But this this is just a restatement of the idea. Um, so is this. Uh, every, every word sort of guides the reader through new perspectives. So this is just a restatement of the idea. This um, this is bolded because it's sort of the other half, the complement to this other bolded idea. So this is talking about what is the job of a writer? Uh, like, if you're talking to a writer, if I'm talking to a writer, what should their job be? Whereas this perspective for this is flipped. So towards the end, I really want it to, like, especially if the reader was a writer, and I think everyone is a writer to an extent, um, like every human is a writer to an extent. I, I really wanted to implore in whoever was reading this that like, yes, you, you as a writer, I will now tell you what your job is because I think it is that important. Uh, so instead of just saying like, oh, a writer's job is whatever, whatever, I wanted to say like, okay, now I'm going to talk to you as if you were a writer. Um, and then I'm going to tell you what your job is and what you need to do because I think it's that important. And so this is where that inflection, um, point is, um, so I specifically said like for you, a writer, and I'm, I'm making that assumption, but I think it's. It, buried in this statement is also this idea that like I think every human to an extent is a writer. Like every human produces some writing over their life. Um, so for you, a writer, your job is to explore and discover the world on behalf of the reader. That's kind of normal. To feel and understand and investigate. There is a rule of three, there's three adjectives, until your glasses become tinted with color and then to lend those colored lenses to the reader so they may see the world as easier. And this is just, this is obviously just a metaphor, um, but it's a metaphor that, that repeats later as we'll see. And um, and I like I like the expression of this because one of the main ideas that I started this post with was this what I think is kind of this beautiful idea that that if you're a writer typically you think of of a writer as someone who's like holed up in an office and typing things out and kind of thinking from their from their head and not from their body um, and that's the conventional image of a writer but I, I really love this idea that that. Um, the, the task of a writer, if you're a writer, what you need to actually do is go out and experience the world. Like you need to go out and do the crazy things and um, experience love and hurt and, and anger and, and, and um, have those experiences to then speak from. And so um, 
I'm saying go out and feel and understand and investigate the world so much that that like you you like walk through you know harrowing days and dust and and and, and all of that sort of hardship settles on your glasses and your glasses become tinted uh, from that challenge with color um, and I really I, I really love that kind of imagery and then and then once that 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 dust has settled on you then then lend those colored lenses to the reader so they can see through your glasses literally. Uh, through your perspectives. So I think this is, I, I really like this metaphor and, and because I like it, it's gonna come up again. Um, but this this is the metaphor that I come into drawing um, and, and that's what's in that sentence, I guess. Um, the last two paragraphs, uh, this is a brief aside that I make. So, so I think this post would actually work okay without this paragraph either. It can literally just jump from this paragraph to this concluding paragraph. But I have this paragraph here because I wanted to make kind of a second sub point. Um, in, in addition to like the writer's job is to explore and discover the world, I wanted to make a second sub point that like, what is the sign of a good writing when you're when you think the writer's job is this? And so this paragraph says the, the if you if you do this well, then here's how you're gonna know. The way you're gonna know is that if you've done well, the ideas that readers find in your writing might burrow into their minds and become a part of the way the reader experiences the world from that point on. This is the impact of the action of writing. As ink on typewriter keys leave marks on paper, the words you write will leave marks in the way your readers make sense of their world. So uh, there are sort of two halves to this paragraph. The first thing is is stating the second subpoint which I have, which is that how do you know whether a writing is good? Is that if writing's good, the ideas that you have in your writing are going to burrow into the, the reader's minds and just become a part. It's going to tint their glasses too, in the same way that it's tinted your glasses, and it's even going to become a part of their perspectives, the part of they make the way that they make sense of the world. Um, so that's that sentence. And then um, here, uh, it's relating this idea to this running metaphor that I have about typewriter keys uh, making action on paper. So this is the impact of the action of writing. Like when I, this is calling back all the way up to, up to here, where like, where does the action of a writer end? Well, now we know, like, because we've done this thinking up here, now we know that the action of writing ends here. It ends uh, as ink and typewriter keys leave marks on paper. Like that's when typewriter action ends. But when when does the the action of like writing itself end? That ends when you leave marks in the way your readers make sense of the world. And so when the readers have absorbed it, and then it becomes a part of the way that they make sense of their own lives. That is the end of the action of writing. So that's that's the like that's the purpose. Um, and this this bit answers the question that I that I ask up here right before I jump into the big big topic. Um, and then this paragraph is my second favorite paragraph in this post, um, uh, and it calls back to usually in conclusions. I like to call back to both the introduction, uh, and I like to call back to if there was like a main metaphor, a main idea, or a kind of recurring theme in the post. I like to call back to that as well because I think it ties everything together and it's kind of like a review of what what you just read. Um, and so this this conclusion. Is, is kind of that kind of review and also kind of a call to action because all this time I've been establishing this pattern of I, I'm, I'm going to talk to you as if you're a writer. And so the reason for that is because I want to, to call upon you to do something. Um, and because I think this imbues, this idea imbues writers with an important responsibility. Um, you're not here merely as storytellers or persuaders or educators or reporters. You are here to be the reader's hands and feet and eyes, reaching into the world for moving ideas and gripping stories. So because this is more of a mood paragraph than an idea paragraph, like I'm not bringing up any new topic here. I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to wrap things up. And so this again has more rhythm. And so uh, you are not here merely as storytellers or procedures to create order, obviously repetition there. Um, and each of these are single syllable. And so there's no kind of break in the rhythm. It's storytellers or persuaders or educators or reporters. Um, uh, like they're single beats. They're not single syllable, but they're single beats. Um, you are here to be the reader's hands and feet and eyes. Rule of three again, hands and feet and eyes. Reaching into the world for moving ideas and gripping stories. Um, moving ideas and gripping stories, adjective, noun, adjective, noun, another kind of like a satisfying beat, I think. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is all call to action. And it's a call to action that calls back to a metaphor from earlier. Take this responsibility seriously. Go out and live a life of color so that new feelings and insights swirl in your tinted lenses. And when you come back and sit down to spill those colors onto paper, may each action of your key bear those colors. May the action of your words transport your reader to ever more colorful worlds, because that ultimately is the job of the writer. 
Um, so this is just kind of, this is like me walking out into the sunset um, after I've given you this idea, uh, basically. And um, that's like the, that's the vibe that I want to leave, leave with at the end here. Um, so this is the actual call to action. Take this responsibility seriously. Well, what does that mean? It means God will live a life of color so that new feelings and insights and swirl into his lenses. And like, this is obviously calling back to the lens metaphor. Uh, but instead of just seeing like, okay, gather, gather, tint on your glasses, this now uh, combines the last two paragraphs. So here it's just like, go get experience. Here it's, it's like, make an impact on the reader. So if you combine those two, what do you get? Well, you go out and you feel things and insights, get insights um, that's kind of swirl in your tinted glasses. Um, and then when you come back, uh, that, that color should then bear on the reader. That should be, it should be worn on the reader. Uh, and I'm just, I, I'm, uh, I'm a, uh, I, I just like the imagery that, that I ended up with here, um, which is that, that this color kind of swirls in your tinted glasses, like, um, like the, the, the kind of mores on, on soap bubbles. Um, and when you come back and sit down to spill those colors onto paper, may each action of your key bear those colors. Um, so in my head when I'm writing this, I had this image of like a dark room uh, with like wooden furniture and this like author and he's like writing, but the, the ink that he's writing with is like the color from the experiences that he's had and not necessarily like ink ink. So that's like the imagery that I was working with and I tried to kind of convey that in words, uh, which is where this like spill those colors onto paper came from. This phrase was initially sit down to type everything out. That was like the wording, uh, which is far too mundane. And so I, I kind of upped the register and now it's spilled those colors into paper. And then this last sentence, may the action of your words transport your reader to ever more colorful worlds, because that ultimately is the job of a writer. Um, a couple of things going on here. One is I end with the job of a writer. Um, and I, I love, ending blog posts with that is like verbatim the title of the post because it's like the, the title which obviously everyone reads in the beginning the title says like okay this is where we're gonna go we're gonna try and answer the question and then by the end we are literally where we wanted to get so we're like literally at the destination which i think is just really satisfying to read um and then this ultimately this ultimately is a little awkward um i wish there was a better way to do this because i added this ultimately because otherwise there was a beat missing so if you read the sentence without this ultimately, this is what it sounds like. May the action of your words transport your reader to ever more colorful worlds, because that is the job of a writer. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can hear it, but there's like a beat missing at the end. Um, because this is seven beats. May the action of your words transport your reader to ever more colorful worlds. So just seven beats, which I think is, again, satisfying. Um, and then this is like the second half of the phrase. And because, because the first phrase of the sentence was seven beats. The second one can't be too short um, because that is the job of a writer. That's three. And so seven and three is like weird. Um, uh, I don't know how else to describe it, but it just feels like there's a beat missing. And so I added this ultimately um, because it felt like kind of the right place to add an extra beat and because I didn't want to break up this phrase. And so uh, because that ultimately is the job of a writer. That's just four extra beats to round out the sentence uh, in a way where, where beats aren't missing anymore. Um, and that is the end of the post. Um, and so that that's just like, that is the breakdown of this post. Uh, not too long, but it's it's unusual from my normal style in that, in that like the first f like 40% or 50%, the first like good 50, 60% of this is set up. And I talked about this, talked about this on Twitter um, earlier. But um, that's kind of unusual because normally you want the intro to be like the top 10%. Um, but here it's, it's a lot longer. And I think it's because, of, it, it's because of two things. One is I really wanted the reader to be in the right mental space. Like if I just dive straight into this, so this is really heady stuff. This is like super abstract. Um, some of my sentences are just like, like very, very, um, like not complex, but like very up there. Uh, like very high register uh, of, of formality and complexity. And if I dive straight into the stuff and they like just came from Twitter, their they're, head's not going to be in the right space. And so part of what the intro does is like it, it gets their mental, like it sets up a stage in their mind that matches the stage that I have in my mind for telling the story um, about about the job of a writer. The, the other thing that this does is I wanted this post to feel 
like a story, like like I was telling you a story instead of just me arguing for something. Because this is the thing that I realized fairly recently, and it was like a realization that I had. So I wanted it to feel like a realization that you had. Um, so the first half is a story, which is kind of unusual. The second half is like driving this point home and then and then tying it all together with a metaphor that kind of carries all the way through. Um, so that is is a post, is my post called The Job of a Writer. Um, and uh, hopefully you liked it and thought this was interesting. If, if you thought that was interesting, definitely leave a comment or, or tell me on Twitter or, or email me, uh, and I might do more of these. And if not, uh, then then we won't. Uh, but yeah, if you made it this far, thanks for, thanks for listening and uh, thanks for reading my stuff.